And there's another permaculture saying uh, that the problem is the solution. Yeah, right. <laughs> I say, but when I you know, talk about yeah. the, the cycle of destruction becoming yeah. the cycle of regeneration, yeah. it certainly sounds very pagan to me again. Yes, exactly. And to me, like I said, this is all practical applications of exactly what we have said so many times. You know, uh, I remember once I visited a friend's class that she was teaching on organic gardening. It was down in Mexico City, and she was speaking it all in Spanish, and she drew a circle, and the circle said something like birth, growth, death, decay, regeneration, you know, and she was talking about it all in terms of gardening and science, but I was looking at it going, that's our theology. Right, <laughs> right? exactly. That's, for us, who the goddess is, is exactly that cycle, birth, growth, death, decay, regeneration. And to say that's the goddess or to say that's sacred, it doesn't mean you have to believe in something outside yourself, you know, supernatural. It means you simply shift your attitude toward understanding that these natural processes are amazing and are miraculous and are incredible um, miracles that happen right. around us every day. That they evoke yeah. awe in us and uh -huh. therefore deserve our reverence. Yeah. And they are the ways that we connect most deeply with one another, uh, with all those life forms on the planet, uh, and that if we approach them with that awe and reverence um, and respect, um, then they can lead us into ways of living and being and working and doing that, again, create more health, more beauty, more biodiversity, um, more freedom, more joy, uh, on the planet, and if we don't, then we get the mess we have now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. We, um, my husband and I went uh -huh. to the Bioneers Conference when it came to Wisconsin, and one of the most fascinating programs uh -huh. that they had, I think, is it's not permaculture exactly, but it's the same sort of mm -hmm. understanding, looking at nature and how nature creates, for instance, ceramics. Yeah. I mean, when you think about, we just went to visit a, a, a potter, uh -huh. and she has these two extremely high temperature electric kilns, and was thinking about how difficult it was to reduce mm -hmm. her carbon footprint because of that. Well, one of the stories that was told was about how shells create their own essentially ceramic uh -huh. structures in a much different way by laying down many layers in underwater. Mm -hmm. So A, it's not, doesn't create a lot of heat, which is our problem in terms of global yeah. warming or global weirding. And B, it doesn't uh, involve, you know, um, destruction of materials that could be used in other ways. It's a, it's a regenerative rather than a mm -hmm. destructive process. So, yeah, I think it's, that's, it makes sense. And when nature becomes our model, you know, when we actually open our eyes and start looking at what's around us, I think then we also find these tremendous allies, you know, we find these tremendous um, gifts um, that if we can look at that and understand that, they can open up, again, great possibilities for more real abundance for us, uh, again, in ways that not only don't harm the stuff around us, but can actually help to heal and regenerate and repair the damage we've already done. Okay, so give us a specific example, like carbon sequestration in the <laughs> soil. Oh, my favorite topic. <laughs> uh, you know, the excess carbon in the atmosphere that is responsible for the overheating and the increased turbulence and the general, as you call it, the weirding <laughs> right, of the climate, you know, comes obviously from burning the fossil fuels. But there's also a lot of it that actually comes from another source. It comes from the destruction of the world's soils um, through plowing and through erosion and through oxidation of the carbon that's held 
in healthy, you know, humus-rich living soil, uh, there's a lot of soil organic carbons that are stored by bacteria, they're stored by fungi, um, they come from the decay of plant roots and plant material, and they build up over time into this tremendously rich humus that's fertile uh, and that helps hold the soil um, and that holds great amounts of carbon. When you plow that up, when you expose that to wind and dust and erosion, all that stuff gets oxidized and you've got that carbon and the oxygen mixing and creating carbon dioxide. So there's a researcher, Dr. Ratan Lal, at the University of Ohio at their Soil Carbon Institute, who believes that we have as much excess carbon in the atmosphere from the Dust Bowl in the 30s as we do from every automobile ever invented. Now that doesn't mean we can just go, you know, burning fossil fuels. <laughs> uh, but what it does mean is that the world's soils are hungry for carbon. And that if we can find a way of fulfilling that hunger, uh, we can actually take carbon out of the atmosphere and sequester it, put it into the soils in ways that are very stable. Those Hum humic acids, those soil organic carbons, can be long-lived and stable. They can live 50 years, you know, um, which would give us a good head start on solving this problem. Uh, so when people talk about carbon sequestration, you know, s let's stop thinking about these high-tech schemes of injecting it into underground seams and uh, these terraforming things of shooting giant mirrors into space. <laughs> right now. Uh, uh, Star we come Wars back, again. We yes. can find Mother Nature has been sequestering carbon for uh, hundreds of millions of years using plants to do it. And we can do the same. We, you know, the techniques of building soil and adding carbon to the soil uh, are easy, they're low tech and there's no downside to them. Uh, they're not gonna like backfire and turn out to be some terrible th mistake because what they do is they actually repair a lot of other problems. Uh, the terrible problems of desertification in marginal dry lands around the world. Um, again, if we build soil, uh, that soil holds more water. Soil that holds more water becomes more fertile, more fertile soils can grow more food, uh, can grow food and plants that are more resilient to changes in conditions and all the other things that are happening. Um, they become the foundation then for people of nutrition, of health, of um, living decent lives instead of living horrific lives of starvation and war and famine and disease. The one downside that I can see is uh -huh. that it's a very labor intensive, what you're talking about. It is about. labor intensive. And it really, it really implies a change mm -hmm. of values and a change of lifestyle for at least those of us who live in industrialized mm -hmm. countries. Well, no, you don't think so? I think it requires, you know, it requires a change in our farming patterns. Exactly. You know, and that requires more labor on the farms, but it doesn't mean, it doesn't require every single one of us to go out herding goats. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, I wasn't it, thinking yeah. of herding goats here in Madison. Yeah, uh, although you could. I mean, we have uh, a herd of goats in San Francisco and certain places it's used for mowing and Yes, you know. they're very, right. even here in Wisconsin, up on Door County, they mm -hmm. use that. We were actually talking about it here in, yeah. at First Unitarian Society because we have a green roof. And we were thinking that perhaps we could get a goat or two. But this green roof doesn't need that yeah. kind of <laughs> pruning. Perhaps a rabbit or something might no, uh, be a little gentler. Sedum. Yeah. <laughs> but... Um, no, it, it's more labor intensive than current methods of, you know, animal husbandry and, you know, the horrific factory farming meat right. production stuff we have. But, you know, one of our huge problems is unemployment. <laughs> you know, right? 